Texas Instruments TI-99-4A, for a brief time, lauded it over the opposition. It was greatly improved from the original Slash 4, available for a reasonable sum of $525, and adverts for it were filled with bedazzling graphics and the like. It can run games like Pac-Man great! And it had a cartridge system, meaning that you didn't have to wait ages for anything to load on floppies or tapes. With Apple and Atari both spinning their wheels, the computer dominated the rest of 1981. And yes, TI did the same thing as Commodore. The computer was available on mass merchandising shelves immediately. As all the poor beleaguered computer dealers sat crying into their eggnog, Commodore realised that cutting the price of the VIC-20 would only take them so far. They needed something more. At least their engineers did, the twin architects of the C64, Al Charpentier and Bob Yannis. Of course, the best thing to do would be to try and innovate, do more with the 6502 line, build a true 16-bit system. But wait, that costs money? <laughs> Bullshit. Jack Trammell wasn't having anything of that. The new computer would be 8-bit again. You see, Jack Trammell is the sort of person who doesn't believe in budgets, and by that I don't mean you can spend whatever you want. In Trammell's eyes, giving somebody a budget was basically giving them a license to steal they would go ahead and spend all of that money, they wouldn't make any decision that would take them under that budget. So, yes, he was a tightwad. Anything that cost the company more than $1,000 had to be personally approved by Jack himself. Jack was the absolute captain of the ship, a detail-seeking equal amount in each muffin micromanager, the definition of domineering. When he wasn't in the office to approve anything, no work ever actually got done. The new Commodore computer could have easily been an utterly backwards pile of garbage that was virtually rotten on its arrival, if not for the brilliant engineers Commodore had working for them. Usually young folks, hired because they were young and that meant they could be paid a lot less than a more experienced guy, but people with their own interesting approaches and ideals. Charpentier made a proper full upgrade of the Vic, the Vic 2, absolutely full of tricks that squeezed everything possible from those 8 bits. And Bob Yannis? Well, he made the sound interface device, the SID chip. A device that still bedazzles even today. It's basically a fully featured synthesizer on a freaking chip. People still struggle to decipher just how he managed to pull that off. The rest of the computer's tricks were based on bank switching, meaning most importantly that the computer could lay claim to 64 kilobytes of memory. No one was less interested in the technical workings of a computer than Jack was, but he knew a good number when he saw it. Still, the actual naming of the system, originally known as the VIC-40, was down to Kit Spencer, who suggested the Commodore 64 in order to really hammer that number home. Charpentier and Yannis did all of this with basically no money, they didn't have it to spend. I mean, the computer was a pile of rubbish in some regards, whether it was a horrendously slow disk drive, still having that ancient basic, or the fact that Trammell was so tight that he wouldn't even have a new case designed for it, reusing the one from the VIC-20. But in so many other regards it overachieved, to the point where the failings became almost cute idiosyncrasies. The field was virtually cleared come the winter of 1982. Apple's computers were looking a bit old, especially the Apple II. Atari's even more so, they hadn't released anything since 1979. Five years down the line, no one aside from the most out there hacker has really figured out what the Trash 80 even is. The stage is set, Commodore in one corner, Texas Instruments in the other. The latter is looking to dominate the market and do away with Commodore once and for all. The former, motivated by nothing but revenge. There would be no pretense of a good clean fight, the gloves were already off. War was imminent, the bloodiest war in the history of American microcomputing. Texas Instruments struck the first major blow, mere days before the launch of the C64, with a move that nobody could have seen coming. If you buy the TI-99-4A, you will get a hundred dollar rebate. Boom! What a hit! Sure, the benefit will only be reaped a few months later, but essentially they'd knocked a hundred dollars off the price of their computer. At this point a TI-99 cost 300 without the rebate, a VIC-20 was 250, and a C64 was 600. So a Slash 4A was effectively $50 less than the low-end machine. 
Despite an immediate price cut of the VIC-20 to 175, Texas Instruments won the Battle of Christmas 1982 decisively, outselling the VIC-20 3 to 1. The VIC-20 was down, but not out. As we'll soon see, it still had an important role to play. Commodore redoubled their efforts on the C64 with a marketing campaign that relentlessly hammered home those crucial numbers and was openly savage towards all the competition. It was a tactic that would besmirch their name with just about every other major computer company, but they, or rather Tramiel, didn't care. And yes, they went ahead and screwed the dealers again. Jack truly promised this time that the dealers would have the C64. He gave them his word, and indeed they did have it at Christmas. And a few days after Christmas, the C64 was on the Kmart and Toys R Us shelves. Boom! Not long after this, having savaged them utterly, Jack cut ties with all of his remaining computer dealers. The stakes in the war become ever greater in 1983, thanks to the video game crash. Now all of a sudden the computers are the leaders in that market too. Everything seemed up for grabs. But the truth was, Tremel had already won. It was just a question of by how much. This was the decisive strategy, to compress Texas Instruments with a pincer movement. On the low end, thanks to the general cheapness of the VIC-20, Jack could keep cutting that machine forever. There was no way that the TI-99-4A would ever be cheaper than the VIC-20. And on the high end, well, the C64 wasn't exactly expensive either. There was plenty of room for cutting. And while TI-99's cartridges had their positives, in the end, it was too much vertical integration. An attempt to capture the software revenue stream that failed because, well, having to have all software licensed by TI was an unappetising proposition compared to the C64 where you could just do whatever the hell you wanted. That little bit of freedom on the software front was what made the C64 tick, the decisive advantage. For TI to chase the VIC-20, as they were doing, was like chasing a white whale, and all the while the C64 was bearing down on it from the top. TI would be crushed. Faced with this, there was nothing that TI could do but desperately keep on going lower, which they did, and it never changed a thing. By the time that the TI-99 had reached 150, it was breaking even. And no, Commodore weren't finished by then. The cuts would continue, so that the TI had to go lower even than that, selling the computer at a loss and literally not profiting from anything. And my god, that $100 rebate turned out to be a terrible idea. By the end of it all, TI were basically paying consumers to take their freaking computers. And the cuts continued. They would not stop. Soon the C64 itself was available, on the shelves, for a mere $200. There was nothing more to be done. In October of 1983, with a final Hell's Heart I stab at V movement of dumping all remaining inventory on the market for less than $50 apiece, Texas Instruments left the computer industry, thoroughly beaten into submission. Jack Trammell had his revenge. The decade of anger that followed TI nearly putting him out of business had truly manifested itself. TI were utterly cowed, and it would be a long time before they would even remotely consider entering the computer market again. Jack Trammell had won. But what of those great men, Al Charpentier and Bob Yannis? They received no raise, no promotion, still engineers, barely above the breadline. Unhappy with this, they left and were treated in much the same way as Chuck Peddle was. On trying to form a new computer company, Trammell smothered them with litigation. Behold the king. Finns should have been just great. They really should have. Come the end of 1983, Commodore are riding spectacularly high. They've beaten their main rivals, Texas Instruments, out of the market altogether. Atari have imploded spectacularly. Apple are struggling somewhat, unable to truly move beyond the now somewhat outdated Apple II. Even the Apple Lisa, the first ever computer to come with a graphical user interface, is not a performer. Radio Shack are also wondering just what to do next, unable to follow the TRS-80 with another successful product. IBM, while holding down business, have not been able to make any kind of dent in the home, something that continues in 1984 with the release of an utter flop by the name of the PC Junior. Commodore are now virtually unopposed in the home computer market. They lead it by a long, long distance. Jack Trammell sits atop of his blood-red throne.
but not for long. In spectacular fashion, on January 16th, 1984, Jack Trammell announces that he is resigning from Commodore. The information was scarce. Some people knew that a week or so previously, at the Winter CES show where Jack had announced that Commodore had made a billion dollars in sales over the previous year, he'd had a huge argument with Irving Gould behind closed doors. Not uncommon, but this one was particularly savage, and Jack walked out of it. On January the 13th, in the boardroom, that all came to a head once more. Tramiel walked out of the boardroom that day, walked out of the office, and never set foot into Commodore's headquarters again. There's a lot of speculation, of course. Let us never forget who was behind the throne. For nearly 20 years, Jack Tramiel had been in Irving Gould's pocket. His money was essential to the company's continued survival, and Gould had more shares. In a straight fight, the boardroom would have always backed Gould. Despite all this, Jack ran the company as if it were his own. Largely, Gould did not have a problem with this, but some have wondered if Gould thought that the way Tramiel had reached the top, through scorching every single thing in his path, getting rid of so many people, micromanaging the whole thing like his typewriter shop, was actually tenable. Maybe he'd just made one too many enemies. While Commodore had made a billion dollars, Gould wanted more. He wanted Commodore to be one like a Fortune 500 company, which it wasn't. More than that, Tramiel had already anointed his successors. They were his sons, Sam, Gary and Leonard, all groomed for the top through the best education and experience in specific areas, management, finance and tech respectively, and all very capable. For Jack, Commodore had always been a family business. It's highly likely that Gould did not see Finns the same way. But let's not be kind to Irving Gould here. The most detailed report on what happened that day comes from one of those sons, Leonard. Apparently, Irving Gould was treating the assets of Commodore as if they were his own personal fund, presumably taken from them as he saw fit, for whatever Gould needed said money for. Jack said that Gould couldn't do this while he was still president, and Gould had one word to say in response. Goodbye. We will never fully know for sure what happened, all of those reasons why are perfectly believable. And we will never hear anything from the horse's mouth. Jack barely spoke of it while he was alive. And, well, you think Irving Gould would have gone to some sort of bloody Commodore convention? Anyway, he's gone now too. So, Tramiel's no more, replaced by Marshall Smith. Smith goes down in history as the man who was president at the time of Commodore's deal to buy the Amiga, and that's about it. He's certainly much more genial than Jack, but he has none of his drive and grit. By the time the Amiga came around, Commodore's empire was in collapse. The company was losing millions upon millions of dollars in 1985. One could point to a total failure to make any upgrades to the C64. There was the plus four, but it was largely treated as a joke. Just another Commodore non-upgrade because no one at the top was ever willing to spend anything, and a product that was started under Jack, but would have never come out under his purview. The new team felt they had to see it through, even though it was clearly a dog. However, that's not even close to the full reason. This story, not just of Commodore, but of the home computer as a whole in America, has a very definitive end. Since 1977, the American people had been told this. You need a home computer. You don't just want one, or would desire to have one, you need it. It's going to be so important. If you don't get a home computer, you have literally failed your children as a parent. This wasn't a con job. For the most part, the people behind the computers, Jobs, Wozniak, Pedal, et al, believed absolutely in the necessity of the computer. To bolster this, there were all sorts of demonstrations, examples of the brilliant stuff you could do with your computer, how it apparently made life so much easier. Do your shopping list with the computer, do your budget, your taxes, your homework, your room plan, your contact list, your everything. It can all be done with the computer. And yes, you can do all these things, but it does take quite a lot of work. The average person isn't going to feel confident about doing this when they turn on their computer and all they encounter is a blue screen saying, ready, and nothing else. It's like, so what now? The truth is, a great deal of the American people had been sold a computer, had turned it on a few times, been befuddled by it each time, were too impatient to learn the programming know-how required to do these things that they apparently could do, 
and, well, they'd promptly shoved it in an attic somewhere never to be used again. It's not exactly difficult to find a good condition vintage home computer in America, probably a lot easier than it is to find one over here, because this was, quite a lot of the time, their fate. Guidance was confusing and difficult to come by, especially as more and more computers were now sold on the mass merchandise shelves and not in the shops of dealers who actually had a clue about them. In 1984, the American public finally asked the question, why? Why do we need a computer? And the computer's response was found to be wanting, because truthfully, in this period, you didn't need a home computer. That's the sad truth. You had not failed your kids by not getting them a computer. They would still be able to do their homework just fine, and they didn't need to know basic to pass a school year. There appeared to be no actual advantage to doing all these things like your shopping list or contact list or whatever on a computer, as opposed to just doing it on freaking paper like you'd always done before. It was just, to be American about it, a big old pain in the ass. And a pain in the wallet. By not getting a computer, you certainly save yourself a lot of money. Not just on the computer, but on all the other crap you need to do all these things that the supposed and virtually fictional modern computer family does. Printers, monitors, modems, extra disk drives, and a crap ton of software. And so the public said no, we don't think we need computers in our lives. And so the American home computer industry fell through the floor. That was why the American computer crash happened. There was one thing, one market, that kept the home computer industry from total annihilation. The gamers. The thing that everyone marketed out of the side of their mouth. You don't want to admit that the best thing the computer does is games, even though it clearly is. I mean, everyone knows load asterisk eight one and one. How many of you could name 10 other basic commands? Even while the sky was falling, games stayed strong. The C64, as one of the best and most affordable gaming computers out there, survived on that. The one true American challenger to Nintendo's console-based dominance, with a long life that ensured its place as the greatest selling single home computer of all time. And of course, as we've mentioned plenty of times, the story in Europe was different. We never had that huge price war, the scorched earth policy, or indeed, in spite of whatever Sir Clive thought, the belief that the home microcomputer was ever good at anything besides games. We were just fine. I've digressed a little from our video's main subject, but not really. A great deal of the blame for the home computer crash has to be assigned to Jack Trammell, for his bitter war with Texas Instruments, and for forcing computers into the mass market in such a way. He won, but it was an utterly pyrrhic victory. When all that everybody knows is that you apparently need a home computer, it isn't going to be long before they start questioning that. And when that happened, home computers were doomed. The game was up. It would take another 10 years and the rise of the internet for home computers to truly be necessary, by which time they were much, much easier to understand. Back then, no one knew what they were buying, and no one knew what they were selling. The spectre of Jack cast a shadow over Commodore for the rest of their existence. It hurt the Amiga a great deal. This was a computer that absolutely had to be sold at a specialist, not least because those things aren't ever going to be on the big shelves again. Unfortunately, Jack had burnt the bridges to almost every specialist dealer out there, and then he'd pissed on the ashes. Quite understandably, a lot of dealers told Commodore to get lost. Trammell himself would have similar trouble when he took over Atari, but not to the extent that Commodore had it. It didn't matter that the Amiga was such a trailblazer, it took a lot to convince anyone to get in bed with the snake again, and plenty chose not to. Somewhere, of course, we should draw a line. At some point, I do intend to cover the Amiga and Atari ST in fuller detail than I've done in the past. It would be rude to not cover Jack's final glorious battle and ultimate defeat. However, it would also double this video's length and lend some. One has to draw the line somewhere and say, that's a story for another day. My opinion on Trimmel is kind of complex. For all of his brutality and the gross shit he did, you almost have to admire his brilliance as a businessman and marketeer. He dragged the entirety of home computers kicking and screaming behind him. But he certainly didn't do it in a way that makes him in any way endearing. It would be hard to survive working for him, but you would absolutely believe in him. He treated every working day like it would be his last, until eventually it was, at least at Commodore. 
in the end, I'm not sure if there's ever been another quite like him. He was never motivated by greed. Even if he was making no money at all, if there was no question of ever making money, he would still have a complete and total desire to be at the top. Imagine how far up he'd have gone if, all those years back, he'd stayed in the army. The full version of one of his most famous quotes sums Tremel up for me, and is a good way to finish. Business is war. I don't believe in compromising. I believe in winning. We did not have a clear direction what we're supposed to do. I'm giving you that clear direction. We are here to serve the customer. Give him the best product for the lowest price. The customer is always right. Remember that. We are here to serve each other, and especially the customer. If we will do this, we will win. In case we will only look out for ourselves, how we can put, can put money in our pocket and not service, we will get nowhere. So please, I give you everything what you asked for. Now go out and do it. Many thanks for watching this video, the second part of our look at Jack Trammell and Commodore. If you like the video then do consider liking it, um, supporting me on my social media, subscribing, and also supporting me on Patreon. Now, speaking of Patreons, I have plenty to thank. Jason Leach, Horo Grizzly Bar, Ian Roberts, Drew Bricks, Grafen Blackpool, Ben Coker, Martin Pataki, Taylor Armand, Mark Johnston, Twisted Scroat, Simon Gulliver, Andy Capt, Andrew Dalton, Johan Eriksson, David Page, Conformist, Jake Elrich, L. O'Brien, Keith Barlow, Romeo, Peter Sidorn, Grant Butler, V. Shardy, Tiago Pereira dos Santos Silva dos Santos Silva, Olaf Albin, Dragon Sex Master, Joel Hartman, Phil Taprog, Jamie Hampshire, Lee Norris, Tim Lintz, Robert Kelly, James Malloy, John Davenport, Jamie Davenport, Jan Velton, Olaf Johnson, James Halliday, Marco, Gianni Jaquetta, The Amigos Podcast, Richard Bearwell, Hagenator, Radek, Ken Barraclough, Kenneth Bergen, Alvaro Gonzalez, Stephen Hornsby, Jan Best, Robin Banks, Dan Wasco, Christian Earnshaw, Terry Anderson, Francesco Pimenta, Kev Gilmore, Alexander Green, Thomas Daniels, Greg Olson, Mark Johnson, Stuart Ashen, Lee Harris, James Id, Novel, Gerard Morris, Mike Siegler, Mark Brooks, Russell Hugo, Paolo Leary, Graham Kamak, Scott Mitten, Nicole Ketchum, Ninth Demon, Ludwig Holmstrom, and John Ezell. Phew! Thank you all so much for your brilliant support, I love all of you. Now we won't be staying away from Tramel for long, soon we will have the third part where we will be looking at his time at Atari. But before that, I've got a few more PlayStation football games to look at, so hope you enjoy that, but for now, it's time to say goodbye. Wherever you are, whoever you be, have a good one, take care, and I shall see you next time. Bye for now.